The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, episode 56. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a dead. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Hi everyone, I'm Thomas Sanherho, filling in for Father Fett this week, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away, including the deeper themes and meanings. Today we're going to be a little meta with the show, as we discuss the Disney Gallery series on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I say made up meta because uh, this episode isn't about that galaxy far, far away, but about how that galaxy gets made. <laughs> so joining me for this discussion are Mike Creevy. Hi, Mike. Hey, how's it going? And Andrew Hermes. Hi, Andrew. Hello. So uh, I'm filling in for Father Fett this week because I think uh, he's going to be off this week taking a break. And then next week, hopefully, we're going to have the whole gang back together for the premiere of season two of The Mandalorian. So I'm yes. super excited for yes. that. <laughs> uh, we're going to avoid following our typical format for this uh series or for this show because covering these episodes sequentially would be kind of weird uh so we're just going to spend a little more time talking about the people who are now at the helm of star wars and the direction the franchise is taking especially as it relates to the mandalorian show so from season one leading into season two but kind of recapping the whole thing if you haven't seen the uh disney gallery uh series definitely recommend it i think it's one of those things that if you're at all a fan, it's really interesting. But if you're at all a fan of filmmaking and the the way that things get done and what it looks like to have a set with a giant starship that's not actually a giant starship, but just a little box that somebody's sitting inside, uh, then well worth a watch for sure. Uh, so I, I know there's a lot to unpack from this show, but I'd like to start by opening up to ask if there was any particular person in this series, because it's kind of a series of interviews. So if there was anyone that really connected that you that either of you guys really connected with from the interviews, obviously, besides Dave Filoni, because I think uh, he was everybody's spirit animal from the show. <laughs> like, I have I've saw myself in him so many times watching him <laughs> sit in the show. So how about you, Mike? What do you uh, anybody you connected with? Well, I'm, I'm sure Dave Filoni would not dare, you know, uh, take the mantle of sort of Yoda for himself, of course. And that's <laughs> and it's it's a little like, uh, do you remember in uh, this is a bit of a stretch, but remember in Gladiator when uh, when Richard Harris is trying to get, you know, uh, Russell Crowe to take over the empire to give it back to the people. <laughs> yeah. And he says, do you accept this? And he goes, you know, with all my heart, no. And he's like, that's why it must be you, you know. Yeah. So like Dave Filoni, get the same thing, like, you know, he would never you know, take that on, but it's like, dude, you're, you're Yoda, you know, but next to him, I mean, uh, honestly, um, my favorites probably are, um, right now, I think Deb Chow and, um, Taika, Taika Waititi yeah. it, for different reasons, but with, with, uh, Deborah Chow, she just really seems like, I mean, and, and I was paying closer attention to my mo most recent watch through season one again, um, getting myself back in the swing of things, you know, for this next season, um, paying attention to her episodes and uh she she had uh the sin and um oh, i just forgot the name of episode seven it was, it was, was before it, uh, retribution uh yeah i had that i had that somewhere from before i forget but but that new episode seven which set up eight so well um those are just some of my favorite episodes and uh learning a little bit more about her you know kind of background and her mm -hmm. interest, like, you know, personal interest with, with sci-fi and the action and just her ability to, to really direct that so well, knowing that she's doing the, uh, the Kenobi series they're developing. Right. I'm particularly excited about, about that. Um, and then with, with, uh, Taika Waititi, I only really knew about him through, like, really through Thor Ragnarok, you know, cause that was, I love that so oh, much. And then he, man. he has that, that character was a Korg, I guess that he, like he, yeah. he voiced, yeah. which was, who was so funny. And I, have you, have you gone interviews. back and watched any of his other stuff? No, well, no. See, I, I, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> like I'm becoming a fan now from <laughs> just what he talked about, and especially like he really strikes me as like a really humble guy, and the way he tells the story of how he and um, 
uh, Jemaine Clement, who I always love Flight of the Concords. Like I love those mm. guys yeah. um, years ago and seeing, you know, him telling this story about like him and Jemaine going and like asking for like backup props and stuff from like <laughs> leftover stuff that they didn't use for Lord of the Rings. Like just his appreciation, I I feel like being able to work at such a small level, you know, then when you're given these extra things, knowing what to do with them, he just really seems like he's, I think Star Wars is going to be in good hands with, with him. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, they they spoke to me, I think, quite a bit. Yeah, I saw an interesting interview with him on um, the Q podcast or the Q radio show, uh, which yeah. is a Canadian um, talk show. And uh, they had him on and he was talking about his experience with Thor Ragnarok. And it was really just a great uh, a great exploration of why he did what he did with the with the franchise, and kind of, I, I would say honestly how he saved it because I think Thor I'll was to go kind check of, that out. <laughs> you know, uh, rough, but uh, yeah, if you haven't seen what they do in the shadows, that's uh, I, that was my introduction to Taika Waititi. I oh, had no God, idea who yeah, he was God, before. God. Check it out, <laughs> mine too. Yeah, and, and just just to give everybody a sense of like if you if you haven't watched Gallery, I think the the thing that I told my kids is the the image of them all sitting around the table. It's all the directors sitting around the table, and uh, the image of them all sitting around the table tells you everything you need to know about Taika Waititi because they're all dressed in these dark uh, <laughs> clothes that fit the darkness of the room, the very somber interview concept. And he has on the brightest, like most garish <laughs> jacket yep. that he could find. And so I know he got an email. I know every one of them got an email. We're all going to kind of dress kind of mute tones because it's going to be kind of dark room. <laughs> and, and that's what he decided to go in with. I'm absolutely sure oh. that's how that went down. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so how about you, Andrew? What, what would you really connect with? Um, well, I, I, I would definitely say, you know, again, Deborah Chow and Taika Waititi were two of my favorites. And, uh, you know, just Deb Chow because her episodes were probably my favorite um, overall. I think she had the most quality, uh, you know, throughout the season with the episodes she's, she, she directed. And then, uh, and then Taika, obviously... Um, he directed the last episode, right? Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, Taika, again, I've been a fan uh, for a long time. And and just seeing, uh, you know, his sort of flavor in the Star Wars universe uh, was fun to watch. But, um, you know, other than Dave Filoni, probably the easiest answer is John Favreau. You know, I think, yeah, obviously him, you know, heading this ship you know, so to speak, uh, as far as the, you know, the, the TV series is concerned, um, you know, the impact he's had with introducing the volume, you know, that technology. And yeah. I know we'll get into that. And, and, you know, just, uh, I know he didn't direct any episodes in season one. Right. But I know, I think he's directing the first episode of season two. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's yeah, official. He, had, but he I think. had one. I think they. I think they attribute one to him in the in this series. But I think it's like a co-direction with co one yeah. of the other directors. Um, but yeah, I mean, in any case, I mean, obviously he's uh, you know the the man steering the steering the ship, and and I think you know if you think about where he you know where he started from, you know, like independent cinema, like doing you know swingers, and then yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, direct, you know, directing the first, you know, fast forwarding to directing the first Iron Man, um, you know, and, and, and just, showing up as happy in the, in the Spider-Mans and the Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, uh, but lots of Star Wars cameos too, though, yeah, for him, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, seeing what he did, you know, just starting the whole MCU craze, uh, you know, that first movie had to, had to be, you know, had to, had to hit it, had to hit it out of the park and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, he was a wise choice. Uh, obviously, being already a part of the Disney family to to, to usher in the you know the Mandalorian, and um, you're seeing you know the sort of impact that he's had not only on this show but in, in in TV and film industry now. You know the going back again to the volume, uh, you know technology. Now you're hearing a bunch of film uh, productions uh, adapting that. You know, one, because it's more, you know, you have more of a controlled set in this, you know, this COVID world that we're living in. And you have more control, uh, you know, aesthetically and without spending as much money. Uh, as I've said, I know the Batman is, uh, that's filming right now is, is, right. is going to start using that. And they weren't planning on doing that uh, from the beginning. But, um, I mean, I know we can go on and on. I, I mean, his, you know, I think it was smart to, to have someone with his sort of film background that's so diverse. 
because you know the Mandalorian kind of crosses a bunch of a bunch of different genres. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, you know spaghetti westerns and you know uh, uh, swashbuckling, uh, you know sort of cinema and spectacle uh, and, and comedy and all that. You know every genre you can think of. Uh, so to have someone like that that's kind of dip their toes in uh, all those different waters was was really I think uh, again I think this one of the smarter decisions uh, the Star Wars IP has made uh, mm-hmm. in quite a while so um, yeah he would he would be the guy for me yeah I, I thought it was really interesting when they were talking about the volume and how he was talking about it's just this collaboration of things that were coming together and really he's the guy that was going to be able to do that. If there was any, anybody at that table that was going to be able to pull all of those people together and get them to go in the same direction, he was the one to, to do it. And so, yeah, definitely a great choice for the, for the helm for this one. Um, I was really struck by Carl Weathers. I thought uh, mm. all of those points where he came in in the interview, he's so down to earth. Like he's such a, you know, he's such a down to earth guy and he delivers these just excellent monologues throughout the the series. And then to find out that he was only going to be in two episodes originally, I was like, oh my gosh, that would have been such a waste of, of what has become such a great character. In yeah, Greek he was going to put him in a suit, like some alien suit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that they were going to cover him up with this alien suit and everything. He was like, okay. He was just going along with it. And <laughs> he's like, you know, if I'm here, you might as well have me actually show up on the thing. So that, was, that, that whole set was a great story. And, I, I, you know, I was just, uh, uh, when Gina Carano goes off and starts talking about uh, about him and like you know kind of just saying how much impact he had on her during the show it's like yep that's about how i feel right there that's <laughs> that, that sums it up at this point so uh yeah it was it was really a, a really interesting i, I thought the, the stories from um, bryce Dow- dallas howard about like sitting in her dad's lap and hearing kurosawa uh yeah. lucas and her dad all talking <laughs> at a table i'm like Wow, that is yeah. just what a lucky place to be a kid. <laughs> so. By the way, I does, you mentioned Carl Weathers, and I couldn't believe it because I was just thinking I wanted to remind you, or I want to mention you guys, um, somewhat related, but they didn't mean for it to be. Obviously, um, I was just watching this morning on Disney Plus. They had they you know put up more content all the time, and they had like a Halloween kind of th- sort of Halloweeny kind of themed uh, Toy Story short. Um, but it was from it's apparently from like 2013. I was just looking it up huh. and Carl Weathers does the voice of combat Carl, the, oh, nice. the toy figure. <laughs> so he's talking and I just watched, you know, this prepping for all the, the gallery stuff. And I'm like, I'm, that's gotta be Carl Weathers. And he's trying to coach Jesse on to, to go save Woody. And I swear he says at one point, he's like, you know, combat Carl, you know, like, you know, something, I forget the exact line, but he basically says like, this is the way. <laughs> you know nice. or he says some, something about like you know combat carl like you know like you know, he car, combat carl carl finds a way and i'm like you've got to be kidding me oh, wow. <laughs> i'm like ready to note down like this is what are the odds of this so yeah but i think is, is he in um did they say i'm sorry did they say how many episodes he's is he just doing one or, or more than in one because he's, he's doing season? yeah like he's stepping I'm not sure. up too not sure either yeah because yeah. that was I, the, know, like, I, I know when they said that in in the gallery that uh, and I'd seen in other interviews because they I guess he knew John Favreau from the Directors Guild, you know, and was was talking. Remember, he was talking about how like he was getting away from wasn't acting as much, you know, and he was maybe going to direct and like, no, we, we need you like, you yeah. got to do this, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, I'd like to see him in that role, too. Yeah, no, I, I'm I that would be really interesting to see him kind of take on uh, the helm. I know they had they had a list of. um directors for this new uh for this new season but i'm not sure who I just knew was Robert where. rodriguez yeah. was on there too mm-hmm. but yeah. i don't remember anybody else but that's yeah. that's you know it's what four dave filoni's doing i think one or two again yeah. yeah they said so probably the one with ahsoka maybe i don't know i think they want to if she's in there i think they want to give him as much right. rain be, on that one it's that good be really good yeah <laughs> No, and speaking of Filoni, I think that uh, I think he captured us so well, like like sitting at that table, like all the stuff he was talking about. I was like, man, that should that was that's a po- that's one of our podcasts right yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> that one. And uh, and so, you know, I think he, he captured that sense of like looking back at the Star Wars legacy so well, like like really capturing the fact that this is everybody at that table at all of the tables because he had several different uh, interview tables. Everybody was somehow invested in the series from before and bringing it into a new era. And they were really interested in making sure that they like kept that sense of what star Wars was about uh, and 
brought it into the Mandalorian. Um, and I, I loved my, my favorite part of that was like hearing that they were referring to all of the, um, all of the episodes by their spaghetti Western names. So they were talking about like, you know, the, uh, the seven samurai episode or yeah. the, uh, the, uh, what was it? one of the other ones they mentioned? Oh man. They were, but they were talking about the spaghetti Western. They talked about the uh, lone wolf and cub, which is something right. we'd mentioned right. before. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that's, and that's the way I was framing all of them. Every single one of them I watched, I was like, Oh, that's this movie. Oh, that's this movie. <laughs> so it was nice to see that they were thinking about those Kurosawa films and stuff uh, too. Well, and even some of the aesthetics that they talked about too, that, you know, like the, what's neat is you've seen, or I've, I've seen different things online about, you know, the, the Mandalorian helmet includes different, you know, sort of markers from different things. Like there's like, there's like the crusader helmet. There's, there's mm -hmm. other kind of aspects, but how they talked about the, how it duplicates like the, the brim of like Clint Eastwood's hat almost, right. You know, and yeah. that, and Pedro Pascal's, you know, uh, reference to really leaning on Clint Eastwood, you know, as an inspiration. Um, and then down to the fact that the, the gunslinger stunt man is John Wayne's grandson, which is so cool too. Right. Yeah, that's you right. Know, yeah. But there's yeah. like a, there's even this like this like biological like genetic connection almost like to to that whole world. Um and so that was another big thing for me. I thought it was cool that they're not just pulling from like Star Wars, which I feel like some elements of the sequel trilogy did where mm. it's just like, oh, that's a thing from a movie, that's a thing from a movie. But it's like the fact that they're deliberately going in that process episode, you know, where they talked about going let's we go as a team back to what influenced George. Right. You know, and like assigning them like different Kurosawa films to watch or assigning them like go watch this Western from like the, you know, 1952 or like whatever. Like that was just pretty cool, I thought. Yeah, I thought that was that was such a great way to like pull in the in a, the the inspiration for what Star Wars was and not just making it self-referential. And I think that was some of the problems that I had with the with the newer series, you know, with the with the pre, with the sequel series was that they were kind of referencing back to Star Wars itself. And it's. The, the beautiful thing, I think, about the world that Lucas created in the first three movies was that it was so lived in and there were so many stories. And so, you know, when uh, there's this, this couple of times that uh, Favreau talks about, like, wanting to grab all of the things that didn't get enough screen time and really pull them in. <laughs> I was like, yes, that, that's that's what I want to see more of in Star Wars. Uh, how about you, Andrew? Anything strike, strike you on that uh, legacy range? Yeah, I think, you know, what, what, what stands out is like how much respect and, you know, honor, admiration, obviously everyone has for George Lucas and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they didn't shy away from, you know, just, you know, mentioning like how much of an impact they had on their lives, you know, before they were ever hired, you know, to, to be on, you know, a Star Wars property, you know, John Favreau talked about, he got it, he, you know, he got into this, he, he remembers watching the first Star Wars movies, you know, uh, growing up in New York. And then he said something like he, he was, he got more into the Mad Max type of films. So like he kind of matured out of it. But then as he got older, his taste formed more around, you know, George Lucas and, and Star mm -hmm. Wars. And, and then the visual effects supervisor, John Knoll, he said he got into the business because of Star Wars. Well, his other two options were like mechanical engineer, or chemical engineer, and then then there was like set design, like all, right, all the yeah. stuff that he ends up doing the visual direction. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and, and Dave Filoni said, you know, he uh, I have the quote here actually somewhere. Um, he said that I want to I want to say the quote because it nails it perfectly. Oh, he says he always tries to create Star Wars in the way that Lucas would have created it. So. Mm -hmm. You know, even though George Lucas sold it off to Disney and kind of passed off the reins, and, you know, he's he's involved in some capacity, and especially more so now. I mean, more than he than he was when they, you know, with the the sequel uh, trilogy. You see pictures of him on set uh, on the Mandalorian. You see him, you know, obviously his, his hand is is somewhere in there. Um, so they re respecting what he started, even though he, you know, sometimes he gets flack for the prequels. This was an idea that came out of his head, and th they're not losing that. And I think you know some of the the weaknesses of the, the the latest trilogy are maybe because they forgot about you know what uh, what direction you know he was trying to go towards, um, or at least the the themes or the the spectacle that he was aiming for. Um, and I think this you see it in this show. I mean, this show is a, a lot about spectacle. It's it's really yeah. not a lot of story. Uh, when you get down to it, you know, the story moves along at, at a good pace, but it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's, 
it's really simple. It's not dense. And that's what Star Wars was. You know, that's what the original trilogy was. Um, mm-hmm. There's, I mean, there's this whole, all this lore, obviously, and all this, uh, you know, backstory that you could get into, uh, you know, if you're, if you nerd out like we do. But if I just on a surface level, you just want to watch uh, something nice and shiny on the screen and something that's entertaining. It's, that's what it's there for. Uh, as well. it's, it's there for you as well, if you're that type of person. So that, that's what struck me is like the, the, the legacy that they're trying to uh, hold on to has a lot to do with George Lucas. Uh, right. Uh, making sure that they, they honor what, what he started. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of that. There's that whole, that I, I love the couple of times that Dave Filoni just gets started and they like, let him go. Cause it's like, yeah. oh, yep. 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 <laughs> and, and there's a, he does that a couple of times and, and there's one where he just, he like nails everything that star Wars is about because he starts talking about how, you know, it's about character and uh, it's about, it's the, the modern myth, uh, the modern mythology and, you know, that's what I tell people all the time. It's it, watching Star Wars is like a really good Brothers Grimm tale or, uh, you know, a Mother Goose rhyme that, that, yes, it might be something that is for kids, but there is so much there that you can take away if you just allow yourself to like really mull on it and think about it and kind of go that next step. Enjoy the spectacle, enjoy like all the, the cool effects and stuff like that. But when it's done well, it's a simple story. And sometimes those can be really the best stories, you know, the, the ones that take us the furthest because they allow us to see ourselves in them. Well, and I think, too, that, you know, for us here with this podcast, you know, there's there's a well, I don't know if I, it's might be disingenuous a little bit to say that Star Wars podcasts are a dime a dozen. Anyone who wants to do a Star Wars podcast can do one, but there's so many different <laughs> ones. And, but a lot of them, I think, do the same kind of thing. But we, of course, approach it from our you know faith perspective. Um, and, you know, because when you just said just the stories are the focus for for kids, you know, which which Lucas, I think, had largely said too throughout. Um, well, last I checked, those are the ones who inherit the kingdom, right? Right. You know, the, <laughs> you know, the faith, the faith of the childlike, you know, not childish, but childlike. And that that innocence, that's what I always love, too, with with, you know, even the original movies, you know, that you have, you know, something there, there's an innocence to it. Like they're out there, they're fighting, you know, it's it's they're grown ups, you know, these characters and they're fighting and it's 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 high stakes and everything. But there's still there's an innocence about them, you know, mm. um, even someone like Han somehow to a degree, you know. That I just feel like it's in some of the newer movies, you know, there's those moments where there's like a little like an off color kind of joke here that doesn't fit or just something where it's like they're trying to strip some of that away, you know, to try to meet a perceived, you know, cultural niche or something. And it just doesn't land. But it's what's amazing about Star Wars to me is like, I feel like the like the family, because I think that's what we are. You just know if it doesn't belong there or not. Yeah. You know, and there's just this kind of in, in like in inherent like eh, i don't really i don't really buy that one you know it's there's something about mandalorian that and, and seeing this show i love this this behind the scenes thing of just seeing that it turns out the people behind it get that you know that they all yeah. do and that that was a like a precondition for them being at that table <laughs> it's like do you love star wars do you reverence it you know so that is awesome yeah and i think um i think it's really cool that you know even going back to the legacy that that you can't avoid talking about Lucas's vision, but also about like where he wanted to push things. And mm-hmm. he like, he really wanted everything to be, uh, you know, so far advanced. And they, they talk about that, like with the, with the, uh, the volume when, when they brought him on set and he's looking around and, and <laughs> basically this was like a thing that he wanted. Like he, right. he had invented this in his head, but never had the technology to kind of right. fit with it. And so like hearing that, <laughs> that conversation between Kathleen Kennedy and John Favreau, you know, where, uh, they're talking about like this was uh, George's garage, I think is how they reference. Yes, it. that was yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I think that's really cool. That's a that's such a great way to like to think about you know the not only are they really immersed in the lore and the you know the background of of what everything is and and some of the even the silly stuff like the ice cream bucket and all, all of that kind of stuff. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. But, yeah, but you know they're like really <laughs> pushing the boundaries in that same way that George was. And so you know you, we talk about. The volume uh, where there's like this screen in the background that's representing everything that the camera is seeing. And I loved watching that. That was the coolest thing, watching the camera pan around and the background actually change to fit what the camera was seeing. 
Well, I, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask Andrew about that a little bit, too, because I don't know if like just as, as a as a film guy, because I'm, I'm sitting there fascinated by like it makes sense to me. But I mean, I I don't know enough about it with, with what they're saying about the lighting and everything, but it just seems like it's such a game changer. Oh, it honestly is, because, you know, th- there have been like you said, there have been versions of this, you know, and, and, and Lucas was kind of at the forefront of it. Like he I mean, that's kind of what he was envisioning with you know Phantom Menace. Again, everyone gave him crap, you know, for making it all green screen, which is funny. It's like, because uh, they mentioned um, in that episode that uh, Phantom Menace actually had the most uh, miniatures than any other yeah, Star Wars film. Right. I didn't <laughs> Practical know that. Miniatures, it, was, yeah. so. <laughs> it was kind of funny. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, what's amazing, because, you know, what what really drives that volume technology is is that the the Unreal Engine, for those who don't know what, what, what that even means, is uh, basically it's, you know, the Unreal Engine is, is, is a popular not software, but I guess coding background or whatever. I don't know the, the speak for it, but um, that, that drives video games, which, which allows, you know, like these, these crazy graphics to perform in real time. You know, uh, while, you, while you're mashing buttons, you know, it's, everything has to happen in real time. And, 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 you know, we know video games look more and more realistic these days. But so now right. applying it to, uh, to a, a film set, to where you can be a director and, a, and you have your visual effects guy and your producers be like, oh, uh, I think this needs a little more red over here. Let's move this building to you know over there. Let's let's light this differently. Let's you know X Y and Z. And and with you know the technology we have with you know LED panels and hmm. and all that to, to to be able to to light up a set a background you know bright enough to where you can shoot it on film and make it look realistic. Mm-hmm. I mean, that saves you having to build sets or, or, or shooting at some location and having to hire, you know, a crew to travel there. And, and it, it just, it saves money and at the same time makes everything more efficient. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable what you can do with this. And, 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 and now you're hearing, like I mentioned earlier, more and more directors are taking notice of this and be like, like, yeah, this is the way to go. I mean, this makes it yeah, so right. much easier and, and just makes so much more sense. And it puts, you know, more money in the pockets of uh, right. of Disney and all those studios because they don't have to spend as much uh, making right. the, the films. Uh, but they're yeah. still achieving the same quality uh, right. that they would if they were to shoot it on a, on a live set. Because, again, you watch the show. It, it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like, you know, uh, your cable, your run-of-the-mill cable sci-fi series, you know, where right, you right. can tell that, eh, okay, the effects are not as good as the movies. No, this is, this is uh, right up there. Like Jerry Seinfeld's apartment, you know, it's like, it's like half an apartment. <laughs> right. You know, exactly. then it works, but it's, <laughs> yeah. like, well, that, it's, it's, it's funny too, because like watching, watching a show like The Expanse, they can get away with it because it's all set on ships. Uh, right. If they do go uh-huh. to a planet, they're mostly having to be indoors because the planet doesn't have an atmosphere. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to get away with that kind of stuff. And, and when you look at the sets on the Mandalorian, they're so sprawling, they're huge. They, they feel really big and very yeah. lived in and very, much like you could just walk another, uh, you know, 20 feet and you'd be in a different part of the set that's not actually there, but it's just represented on the on the screen like that. And well, so like for, Carl, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, except for, for anybody else who doesn't know that about the, the gaming thing, I think the really cool thing here is um, in, in a video game, when you're looking through the screen, one of the things that the video game has to manage is the assets that are there. So like if you see a forest of trees, those are the only trees that actually exist in the video game at the time that you're looking. And then when you turn, the video game has to populate the trees at the other area that you're turning to and then mm-hmm. depopulate the trees that you were just seeing. And so that's that's where the power, that's why when they talk about a game engine, you know, you think, yeah. oh, why does, why does it need to be a video game engine? That's exactly what they're doing in, you know, right. with, this, with the volume is only what is necessary is visible behind the camera. And I, I, my favorite part was like watching the multiple cameras, like one camera would yeah. swing in yeah. and the background would change to fit what that camera was and seeing. That, and that parallax <laughs> change and stuff. And you're right. like, what is happening? <laughs> I, I would love to hear from the actors, not only because you hear from the actors how they felt that it made things more real, but it's got to be disorienting, too. That's got to be oh, yeah. really weird, like watching the background suddenly get really far from you <laughs> rather than just being right up on you. Like, oh, OK, how did that happen? Well, the funny thing is, like, you know, I mean, because it's it's. It's so easy to, you know, kind of armchair quarterback like people's acting performance, you know, and, you know, we just 
some of it's believable, some of it's not. You know, some people are better than others. It's like anything else. But by the same token, I, I really appreciated what Carl Weathers was saying about, like, when they're on the Lava River in Episode 8. And, yeah. you know, like, not to downplay this, the, the the craft of acting, but by the same token, like, the way he sounded, like, the, I think the way he was putting it was, it enhanced in a sense, their their ability to kind of read off each other because it's not three different people, you know, imagining three different potential things. It's like they're really in this boat. There really looks like they're going down this. So, you know, they see something, they can react to it because it's like it's it's like that next that's, you know, that much closer to reality, you know, mm-hmm. to assist them in their performances. Because, um, I mean, I I don't really think anybody in that show came across, you know, I, I had some issues with with. uh What's his name in, in the, the Tatooine episode? Callahan. You know, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, that wasn't quite, you know, eh, you know, but but other than him, you know, and even he was you know, better than some people in some of the movies, you know, but sure. it, I just I really think it, it it that probably helped them because it just felt that much more real. Like we're in Star Wars, you know, so we act like that's where we're at, you know? Yeah. And then I thought the the pre-visualization thing was really cool, too. That's another yeah. thing that was uh, like being able to like kind of vr lay out the whole thing and that's what i i love that they mentioned it and they talked about it enough for you to get a taste of it but i really want to see that in action like i want to yeah. see what it means that they were you know like yeah, that doing was this visualization yeah. thing i don't know that, that would be really that'd be really cool and um i I, I I hope they continue to do these Disney galleries. I know that they just had this one because the Mandalorian was so innovative and so new, but I would love to see some of the other stuff that um, they come up with. And even if it just ends up being Disney gallery, the Mandalorian too. <laughs> was, well, well this scene, was that, was that previous it. stuff like primarily for, was that primarily for like the action, or like action sequences or, or was it for other stuff too? I, I, it seemed to me like they were mostly focusing on like that. It can help with action scene choreography and that kind of thing. It it sounded like they were using it for almost everything. That's okay. Like, because I, I mean, even the even the more talky episodes, they were talking about uh, having previsited it, and then that helping them with blocking out where people were and what they were doing. I think camera angles was the real thing. They were they were talking a lot about the camera angles, like being able to get on set right. and and change the camera angle based on what you were seeing in VR, and not have to do that with everything out and, and already right. visible and ready to go. So. That was that was really nice. I, I think that I, I I imagine that would help a ton. So I would love to see more about that. And I think it's a, a fantastic use of um, VR tech of just like the, the ability to put on a mask and kind of look yeah. at these things and and not have to go to a set and make a set, but have these kind of, you know, they're blocky, but you can imagine you can fill in the rest your own. And then to actually see that executed on the day of filming, that would be really cool, too. Hmm. So Yeah. And, and, you know, you get to have like an actual cinematographer actual camera person manipulate the camera if you're doing like a full cgi shot instead of like doing it all in post and manipulating right. the camera in post so it's it, it, again it just adds to the you know the cinematic quality to to these films um and, and just making the world feel real yeah and it's almost like it's like storyboarding in the modern age like like storyboarding has been the same thing for a very long time and now we're kind of pulling it into this okay well we have these things we can do Let's go ahead and try and use them and make them work. Yeah, I think um, the other thing that really struck me about this was listening to all of them and how passionate everybody was about Star Wars. You know, we've, we've talked about that a couple of times, hit on the, the passion that people have for it. And um, I think, you know, lately we've gotten a sense of the Internet being what the Internet is, which is kind of this factory for drama. <laughs> And um, how the passion of Star Wars can be turned into this very dramatic, like, you know, negative thing. But I, I, it's really nice to see this group of people uh, come together around uh, around the passion of the show. Like what what Star Wars does that makes people uh, really love it. And there there were a lot of, of nerd refer- references in the, in the show. They they talked a lot about things and then they would say that they were nerding about something. And it was funny because most of them were self-referential. <laughs> like I thought that was really interesting where they they found themselves becoming more nerdy about it as the as the show progressed. Um but then there were there was also this, this sense of uh that investing in it made it more worthwhile, which I thought was a really cool uh kind of tie in and I, th- I think probably the best example they did not talk about bill bill burr enough 
oh, <laughs> in, this, in this series. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> because my I really, <laughs> I really would have loved to hear a little more of his story. So oh, if, you, if, if anybody doesn't know, uh, Bill Burr uh, is, was very vocally anti-Star Wars. Uh, for a long time <laughs> and uh, like made many comments about Star Wars and how horrible it is and how dumb it is. And uh, and so I, I would love to have been a fly on the wall in the, co- in, fly on the wall in the conversation of trying to get him to be on the show <laughs> and to see how that went down. But then for him to turn out being like one of the really interesting characters uh, that that came up in this show that had a lot to them that you kind of want to explore more about. I think it just gives light to how uh, how you can look at Star Wars from the outside and say, this is really dumb. But then when you get involved and you just give it that chance, it'll it'll take you on a pretty crazy ride. Um, so what do you guys think about this? Uh, the passion for let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the passion that everybody had for uh, the series. Where did it really stand out for you? Well, I mean, we can't talk about that without mentioning again, you know, Dave Filoni's I mean, his infamous duel of the fates. Uh, you know, oh yeah <laughs> rundown and yeah yes uh you know the importance of that uh you know that it kind of you know laying the groundwork for all of star wars you know i think that video clip obviously more than any other clip from the from disney gallery probably got retweeted and reposted the most you know and it, it, it's a good encapsulation of you know the the nerdy star wars fan you know like a lot of us feel like we have to defend <laughs> why Star Wars is good, you know, to other people. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, to the, you know, we all have those friends who are like, I don't get it. Why is Star Wars so cool? You know, and then mm-hmm. you hear someone like Dave Filoni, you know, explain something like that and, and break it down. It's like, this is why we think it's cool, you know. It's, right. <laughs> um, uh, again, this is a, you know, a kid's show, um, a, a kid's property, uh, I should say. You know why us adults, as we get older, become even more fans of the property. I know when I was younger, I was a fan, but like I'm, I'm more of a fan now than I was back when I was a kid. Uh, it's it's stuff like that. It's it's like growing up and realizing, making more connections, and uh, obviously the nostalgia is a big part of it. But stuff you know, nerding out on stuff like that is is something that we that we like to do, and what connects us, and why we have podcasts like this one. Uh, where right. we get to do it, you know, for fun and, 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 and why we get excited about, you know, what this property has in store for us next. Um, and looking forward to season two, the Mandalorian and the Obi-Wan show and, and whatever comes out. So, yeah, I think that's, that's the big standout. And then obviously when you hear everyone else talking about, you know, the thing about the action figures they used to play with and even the more obscure ones, as Dave Filoni <laughs> refers to them as the peg warmers. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> You know, when you hear people talk about stuff like that, it, it, it really, it, it makes you feel confident that, okay, these are the right people that should be working on the show. Because you hear all the yeah. time about filmmakers or, you know, the TV showrunners that do their adaptations of big properties. And you find out like, oh, they weren't really fans of the property to begin with. They just got hired because they were the hottest name or whatever. And that usually you see that in the quality of the work, it, 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 the results are usually uh, not so good. So yeah, I think, I think Disney gets it. They didn't have to make a show like Disney gallery to begin with, but mm-hmm. uh, it was kind of just, right. <laughs> <laughs> but they knew that's what the, you know, the fans want more, you know, it's, it's a, uh, or a show that's, uh, you know, only eight, eight episodes a season. You know, I, I know for all of us kind of just went like a, you know, snap of the finger. Um, and, and we just wanted more and, and they were smart and, and, putting together a show like this to, you know, to allow us to, to revisit um, the Mandalorian and then get a sneak peek you know, about the behind yeah. the scenes and get some nice tidbits from, you know, the people behind it. I think it was really nice to see Kathleen Kennedy too talk about, you know, her experience with George doing the, the indie films and, yeah. you know, place. Cause I think that's one of the things that gets talked about a lot is like how she's managing the property that, and again, this is back to the, like, you know, the internet, uh, crazy cakes drama train right? yeah we, we don't really uh, know <laughs> yeah you know, i feel like, like i know <laughs> no <laughs> yeah like and like so you know that's i and i, I don't i don't I, I don't buy into a lot of that because it's it's just it's a bunch of noise but that's that's one of the things that they talk about is like you know how kathleen kennedy is mismanaging the property or whatever and then you hear her talk about it and it's like there's no way somebody who knows 
this person, the person behind Star Wars, the way that she does and the way that she's thinking about things and talking about things, especially as she's uh, talking about them in this, these interviews, uh, you know, she's she's just as passionate as any of them about the franchise and the films and, and the way that they're being handled and the way that things are going forward. So, you know, just don't, don't get on the drama train. Right? <laughs> Can I, uh, I'm going to jump back to the Bill Burr thing for just a minute, for a sec, because I was thinking, you know, I would love to see, and I, yeah, obviously COVID complicates things, um, but I mean, I, I feel like what, like a hilarious skit would be like someone, like Dave Filoni or something, like taking Bill Burr through a celebration weekend, <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh. Like, I'm like, that would just be, like, I'd pay money to see it. But, but uh, the idea, like, he almost comes across, like, his character comes across as someone who doesn't, like, he he doesn't like the things he's supposed to like, you know, and he, mm-hmm. he likes the things not, you know, and his character's just so, like, repulsive and, and awful, and it was just such a perfect, you know, and I guess Gungan references and the Canto Bite slot machine reference, and there's just so <laughs> Like they, they give him so much in that, that short episode or, you know, the, you know, little role really just to be able to get that across. It was just, I, I loved it. Um, you know, and it was funny though, because that episode oddly enough had one of my nerd out moments, um, which is so brief, but I'm, I don't know who wrote that episode was uh, cause a uh, Rick, um, oh, I always mispronounce his last oh, name. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, I think he, cause he directed that, but I don't remember who wrote that one. Um, but when they're walking down the the hallway, looking in the cells, and, you know, you get, like, passing glances. There's, like, kind of a quasi-imperial-looking dude. And then there's, like, little face peeks out, and you see the arms of an Ardenian. You know, and, and it's, like, John Favreau's Rio, you know, from Solo. Uh-huh. Like, you just get the impression. It's like, well, that, that was just some, like, red meat for John. You know, whether or not he knew that was going to be, like, they threw it in there, or he wrote it in, probably, because he wrote a lot of them. But I just thought that was... Like fun things like that, where it's like, you don't need to know that, you know, right. you, you don't need to have seen Solo. They're just in a prison ship. Right. You know, or, you, you know just the knowledge of like the, the troop carrier that comes flying. Oh, yeah. in and they like that. That was a Kenner toy that never made it on screen before. So they wanted <laughs> yeah. to put it on screen. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> or the 501st, you know, guys like like that. All uh, of those stormtroopers in that last episode are yes. like, you know, authentic, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just all those little fun details. That's I have. I have a kid that's going to be in the 501st. He already <laughs> has his particular clone trooper picked out and everything. Nice. Like, he's all the way down to what stripes it wears and everything. So. <laughs> Eventually, we're going to get him there. <laughs> but he's uh, he saw that scene. He's like, oh, my gosh, that would be amazing. <laughs> like, well, yeah, wouldn't I, it? <laughs> I'll tell you, I was so happy that I came up with this this little plan for myself of, you know, in enough time that I could do it, of watching episodes one through eight, you know, uh, from season one in this lead up. Because as I just finished this past Friday, you know, I get to the end of episode eight and Moff Gideon comes out with that dark saber. And then it hits me. I was like, oh, my gosh, the next time I watch this show. Like, it's like next Friday, you know, it's going to be episode one of, you know, so because I had this flashback to what I felt like last December and like, I got to wait. You know, oh, my gosh. You know, right. So um, now, of course, you know, but John Car- uh, Giancarlo Esposito was saying we have to wait to what, like season three or four to get answers. Yeah. yeah. Which simultaneously made me upset, but also like, wait, there's three or four seasons of this. Three or you know, four so, seasons. Uh, right. So that's exciting in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Well, and it's it's one of those things that I if they keep doing them in this sort of um, you know one off episode way, and and I think if they keep that mentality of like these are all of our peg warmer uh, yep. Star Wars characters, right? <laughs> That's yep. who we're going to keep throwing into this thing. And so, and, and I know Ahsoka is like bordering on that much right. bigger uh, franchise kind of thing. But, but like the, Gamor- the Gamorrean, like, you know, like boxing match that's come or whatever. Right. <laughs> see the yeah. trailer, like that I want to see. I want yeah. to see those guys again. No, and that's I, I think that's such a great but, but that's really kind of the thing that we need to be doing with Star Wars anyway, because that's what really captured everybody's attention. And yeah. then accidentally, as part of that, if you're doing it right and you're giving everything that really lived in feel, you're building the world even more. And then there's more stories to explore. And right. And and I think and this was always the danger of um, you know, the expanded universe, the legends universe now. Mm-hmm. Uh that they kept adding more more Jedi. This Jedi survived for the, right. the Order of Sixties. This one too, and and that does so much to it. Actually, kind of closes the universe in on itself, where everything's still about the Jedi. So these are all the Jedi that survived Order Sixty Six. Great, fine. But what about everybody else? You know, what about the bounty hunters and the 
the smugglers and all right? the guys that are doing the regular yeah. stuff. Like, I want to see more about them. Like, it took me a while to really be okay with, with Kanan and Ezra. And I came around, because mm-hmm. I, I, love, I love those characters, and I think they, they explain th- how they fit quite well. Right. You know, and especially Kanan, like, it's not like Kanan was, like, a Jedi master. Like, here, here's a guy who's, it's a good question. Like, what happens when you're in the middle of your training, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. and you get cut off? You know, and some of them, like, the, that New Dawn book um, that I think John Jackson Miller wrote, is is a great like what happened to Kanan? Well, you know, nothing too illustrious for a while, you know, and then he kind of finds that, you know. But but yeah, I think you're right. Like when you do focus it too much on the the saga, as George calls it, right? <laughs> you know, it, and you you miss these opportunities to explore these other these other territories that are like this is what's going on while all this other stuff is going on. Like it's just kind of it's so much fun. So I think uh, one of the things that's really great about this gallery series is that it kind of brings in the the idea of the super fan and makes it accessible to everybody else. Uh, I really liked seeing, you know, like Dave Filoni, obviously huge Star Wars super fan. Uh, but then you had, you know, John Favreau, who's like this, he, he's liking the franchise more now, but his real direction for being part of the show was about the the technology and pushing you know what he could do cinema uh in cinematography forward and this was a good venue for it and has and but since then i i i didn't catch whether or not he really was because i think he kind of dodged the question but it sounds like he might actually be a member of the 501 now <laughs> so i'm i'm interested to see what his stormtrooper get up is like he should be <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I, and i think that's I, that's what they were that's what they seem to be hinting at but they never really like fully sold in on it so i'm i'm uh, i'd like to i'd like to know more about uh, his membership in the 501st <laughs> um but i think it's 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 interesting to see that um you know this show really brings in that that love for a nerdy franchise uh and that it's kind of the show's kind of wasted if if it's not if you don't invest in it in that way i mean you can get the you can get the, get the explosions you can watch it and popcorn it and it's great it's, it's okay it's it was a fun movie whatever but if you do just take that tiny little extra step you know uh you can get so much from it. And I, I really like to go back to Carl Weathers because um, he had this whole segment where he talked about uh, the father, uh, the, the father sense of uh, yeah. Vader. And it was just this really great dialogue about, you know, h- how we can find ourselves in these characters and kind of explore the deeper sense of uh, our longings in life through what they're dealing with or our uh, being called to uh, that that hero's journey and you know seeing ourselves in luke and seeing ourselves in ray and and in in this case maybe the mandalorian uh i think it's it's such such a great thing to see that that even the actors that are involved like they they're buying into that kind of bigger concept to it so um i think any final thoughts from you guys about the about the series I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's um, it, what you mean? Well, with the yeah, with the gallery series, with the gallery I, series. I think it's it's. What's funny is sometimes, sometimes behind the scenes things don't interest me, you know, or or, or I, mm. they can lose me a little bit, like a little bit, like the you know the classic, like how the sausage gets made kind of right. discussion. Where it's like, well, <laughs> oh, you know, but but I, I don't know with this with this, it's just so insightful for, for me because like Andrew said earlier too, like there's, you know, nostalgia to it, you know, um, and sometimes there's even a nostalgia to when they mention something about like a behind the scenes thing and you're like, I knew that, I knew that, you know, like, like even <laughs> right. that six or you, you might have a memory of when you found that out as a fan, you know, that they made IG-88 mm-hmm. out of extra stuff from the cantina set, you know, right. like what those kinds of things. But then like by the same token, it's, it's, I don't want to play this hand too much. So like, well, you know, faith and faith, faith first, but so I'm not putting Star Wars on the same level as the Bible. Please, everyone just know that. But um, just like in, in a similar way, you know, when I read scripture and different parts of it mean different things to me at different ages, you know, or different phases of life, um, that to me, again, not not putting Star Wars on the same level of that, but but lending a little bit of sort of maybe lowercase s sacramental um, imagery to to the idea that 
you know, and I think this is really a part and parcel of our of our faith. You know, the catechism teaches it too that basically, you know, creation is in a sense a sacrament. You know, it's something material, concrete. You know, in, in this this sort of world we're used to that communicates greater things, greater messages. You know, communicates ultimately something about God. You know, I get things about Obi Wan or Anakin or you know, at different phases of my life. Um, that resonate with me, you know, that, that I may not consciously be like, Oh, I'm going to today apply this lesson that I learned from the relationship between Obi-Wan and Anakin. Like I would never admit that out loud, you know, <laughs> like even if I believe it, cause I don't want to be made fun of, but no, I mean, it's <clears throat> to me, it just shows the power of, you know, it, it's not just entertainment for entertainment's sake that it really is uh, about hope. It's about deeper themes, you know, and that, uh, as we, we kept saying, there's so many of these, like these kid shows that we were really looking at these animated series the last few months where it's like, mm-hmm. that's deep. Like that was like just war theory in 20 minutes, you know, right. like, so, I mean, it's, it really is a, a, a universe that, that really, I think enables us to have maybe those conversations in a way that, you know, maybe unfortunately is a good word to use. We aren't always good at doing on the surface these days, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we can't really have maybe the, the grown, the grown up discussions that we would maybe want to have, but maybe you can do it in another way. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of my thought on it. And that, that this helps to, I think, explore that, you know, and, and uh, make it a little more obvious than you might not catch when you're watching the show. Yeah. I mean, that was very well said. I'll, I'll echo all of that, but, I, but also on the, you know, just as a, as a show, I just think it's, it's fun and interesting just to hear, you know, the stories on set, you know, now that, and, and knowing some of the personalities, getting to know them a little bit better. I mean, we, we were already kind of familiar with Dave Filoni, but I haven't really, I mean, he doesn't do, I, mean, I haven't seen too many interviews with Dave Filoni, you know, yeah. before this, I mean, right. right here and there. And, you know, for, for a guy who was mainly working in the animated world, you know, those guys don't get as much shine as the, the big film guys and TV guys. So again, it's nice seeing him and, and then all the other filmmakers, some of them, really popular like, like like taika and then some new faces like deborah and, and and rick who's who's done some some uh successful work but more on the the indie level right. but uh, but hearing the stories like about them like we, we know dave filoni obviously super fan been working on stars for a long time but hearing a story like you know you know him having that cameo as an x-wing pilot and and yeah, uh that was, and john's that was a direct, great story and john's direction <laughs> was like you know and just be as bored and as casual as possible like <laughs> how could a guy like dave filoni sitting in an x-wing cockpit you know be bored and casual like that had to, he deserves an oscar or an emmy just oh, for that right, right? That's, exactly <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah hearing hearing all those little stories like that um uh how how george lucas uh you know, talking about the 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 the, the Boba Fett prong gun, um, and saying that yes. it wasn't. Hey, that wasn't me. You know, that wasn't my doing. <laughs> <laughs> and like John Favreau just being like, "What?" <laughs> uh, you know, is it here? Like the, the the little stories and tidbits like that were were just a joy to watch. And, and like every other Star Wars property, like you could you could watch Star Wars Gallery. And obviously, if you're a nerd, you're gonna love it. But if you just are interested in, in how everything was made and, you know, get, get sort of a, a reminder of, too of, of how, you know, ILM has just been on the cutting edge for so long. Of, I mean, yeah. Yeah. we owe CGI literally to ILM. Right. I mean, the, the first CGI character uh, was, was uh, you know, created by, by them. And you think of like Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, the, the visual effects uh, today, you know, owes everything to ILM and, and George Lucas. Um, for starting that so it's it's good to have a reminder every once in a while like, what they've accomplished and uh what they're uh you know what they're still um innovating today uh and and how you know i think cinema is still gonna look towards them you know, for the future i think uh, yeah that's well said and i think it's it's funny too you know how we're kind of coming full circle on this um on things being present in in the real <laughs> with with the actors in real time because uh, you know, you look at a movie like Avatar when it came out and they did the behind the scenes stuff for it. And it was like everything was blue. <laughs> there, was, right. there was literally right. nothing that was not blue behind the actors. And um, it was it was just so sad because you you're like, I mean, how do you even act in, when when you're faced with that? It's just this field of your your imagination. And that's all you have to work with is your imagination. 
now to this point where the actors are, I mean, even some of the set people were apparently confused by the volume and we're, we're at there. I love that story where they say that they they were standing there and like there was some smoke going up in the, the screen and one of the one of the set people was like, oh, there's a fire. There's a fire <laughs> only to find out that it was actually just on the screen and it just looked so real and they were kind of convinced yep. that it was there. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's really cool that we're kind of coming back to that way of thinking about, you know, the very practical effects. And I don't I, I the baby would not have been the baby uh, without that sense of practical effect and those uh the three puppeteers that made it come to life and mm. and really brought it to full effect uh even with s such simple things as moving the hand up onto the mandalorian's shoulder to for that final scene where they're flying away and it's like oh it's it's so like blowing in the wind <laughs> right? i kept rewinding and showing my wife like look at this it's so cute <laughs> so cute <laughs> all right so anything else for you guys excited for, Can't wait know, for next, next time yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right <I'll> <laughs> coming up on friday <laughs> yep <laughs> all right well uh that's it from us uh what do you think about this behind the scenes look at our favorite universe far far away uh, be sure to email us or comment on our facebook or twitter page and let us know you can email us any feedback at star wars at sqpn.com and find starquest on facebook at facebook.com slash starquest media and on twitter at sqpn We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Wars, including Chris N., John T., JP, Robert S., and Lisa B. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Wars and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Also, be sure to subscribe on the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or on the SQPN YouTube channel. And I'd also recommend making sure to share us with your friends. Um, I know that uh, try like two people this week, but as we're coming up on the show, share it with two people that you know are Star Wars fans. As you're talking about them, uh, talking to them about the new season of The Mandalorian, say, hey, I'm listening to this awesome podcast. You should uh, join me. Uh, to find previous episodes of The Secrets of Star Wars, please visit sqpn.com slash Star Wars. Next week, that's right, next week, no more waiting two weeks between episodes. <laughs> we'll have the whole panel back together, hopefully, to discuss the first episode of Season 2 of The Mandalorian, a moment we've all been eagerly anticipating. <laughs> uh, we'll be doing a weekly schedule throughout the second season of The Mandalorian, which will put us up towards the end of the year, and we have some plans for a holiday special of our own after that. <laughs> hopefully, yes. hopefully more enjoyable than the, <laughs> than the, than the Star Wars holiday special but uh we hope you'll be joining us again for this exciting new season uh, thanks again for joining me tonight uh andrew hermes thank you it was a pleasure and mike creepy can't wait for the next one all right and once again i'm thomas sanherho thank you for listening to the secrets of star wars on star quest <laughs>